Greetings fellow Earthlings and welcome to this tiny garage. So we finally got the bearing carrier back from the machine shop. The reason they had it is because if you remember, we had them um, install the wrist pins and size them. And when they did that, they said, hey, anytime we see con rods, normally the big end needs to be worked on as well because it goes out of round. I'm like, okay. And so uh, they took a look at them and it turns out that they are perfect. And they said that's really unusual from what they see. And they normally work on a lot of LS engines is what they told me. LS stands for Luxury Sport, and it's a very common Chevrolet V8 engine, over here at least. And so they said that when they see those, that the, um, this part here always gets stretched out of round. And so what they were seeing to do for me, for this engine, was to put these together, torque them down, put them into that honing machine and make them perfectly circular. But he said, hey, we didn't have to do anything. They're perfect. And so that's one good thing about Porsche engines, I suppose, is the uh, con rods don't go out of round. Now, another thing I had them do while it was there was check all of the clearances uh, on the main bearings in the bearing carrier. And they did that just to double check what I'd done in the blueprinting episode. And they said that it was perfect. Everything was just fine. And all of that peace of mind costs $62.50. And I feel pretty happy about that, that we know that this major part of the engine is in good shape. So now we just need to install the con rods after we put the bearing carrier back together. The bearing carrier came back from the machine shop with the bolts just loosely in there. So really just need to take it all apart so we can get to the individual bits to clean them. So there's our crankshaft stand helping us once again. And we're going to start off with the bank two side of the bearing carrier. You can tell it's bank two because of that rod that sticks out at the end. The IMS tensioner goes on that. And to get these bearing shells out, just push on the opposite side from the tab, the little foot that sticks out, and they slide out really easily. Starting off here with brake cleaner and the stainless steel brush, I thought I'd try it. And yes, for sure, it scratches the aluminum there where the uh, it's all mirror finish, like where it's been milled. For the smooth metal surfaces, I'm using this Scotch Bright pad, which is fantastic. It's a perfect combination of abrasiveness, but it doesn't damage the metal in any way. The stainless steel brush did prove itself as the perfect tool for cleaning up the rougher areas of the aluminum casting. The spray cleaner I'm using says carburetor cleaner on it, but it really, they all seem to be the same thing. Carburetor cleaner, brake cleaner, parts cleaner, doesn't matter. And as we found in episode 26, when we were cleaning the valves, the cheapest one, this one here from Walmart, is the best. It beats ones that are four times its price. And then just following up with those lint-free Kim Tech wipes. Right there when I flipped it over, this little metal thing came out from one of the oil holes. I'm not sure what it does, but they, they have been the bane of my existence at times. That's what they look like. And there I'm just tapping them in place. I have a nightmare of finding one of them on the floor after I've got this thing all back together. I did use the plastic brush to get into the areas of the shiny aluminum that were not easy to reach with the Scotch-Brite pad. And the final stage was some compressed air just to blow any lint or anything I can't see out of the way. Next up, we're also going to clean the bearings. Even though they're brand new, they have been in the bearing carrier for the cryo heat process. They have some plastic gauge residue on them, some oil. And so we just want to make sure that they are perfectly clean also. I've been told that it's very important that there is nothing on the backside of the bearings. As we learned from the blueprinting episode, engine tolerances are so tiny that even a human hair stuck behind those bearings could be potentially problematic. And finally, while everything is freshly clean and dry, I'm putting the bearing shells back into bank two. I mean it, hit that subscribe button. Moving on to bank one now, same drill really, we've got to clean it all up in the same way as we cleaned bank two taking out the bearing shells to begin with. You can tell that this is bank one because on the end there, it doesn't have the rod, it just has those screw holes. Many of you may be wondering, as I was, just how clean does the engine need to be to go back together? Isn't it just gonna get dirty again? 
Well, the advice I've received from multiple sources is you want to have that engine as close to surgically clean as you can get it. Besides removing debris that might cause clearance issues or get stuck in oil passageways and making the engine look pretty, I want to get all of this grime off because I don't want anything that might possibly contaminate the fresh oil that I put into this engine. Heat the notification bell, it's up there. Yes, please. All right, the third part is the crankshaft. We have cleaned this multiple times, but as we said, it needs to be very clean. Starting off with the journals, which is the shiny metal part that the bearings go around. I'm not using anything abrasive on the journals, just the lint-free Kim wipes with the spray. And then that Scotch-Brite pad was fantastic at removing all of the staining on all the other parts of the crankshaft. While not on par with micro polishing or vapor blasting, our garage cleaning session resulted in a fairly satisfying before and after. I would like if you would hit the like button. Next we have the thrust bearings. They are just these two half circles of metal that seem to be a similar metal to the main bearings. And they go either side of the central journal location. Um, which is always number four, whichever way you count from, because there's seven total. Giving them a final clean, because they also got that cryogenic heating process. So what do the thrust bearings do? Well, I think it's fun to think of the crankshaft as a really awkward sword, and the thrust bearings protect you from that thrusting motion that would move the crankshaft towards the front or the rear of the car. On the old thrust bearings from this engine, I only found a little bit of wear on the front one of the thrust bearings, and I'm not sure exactly, but I think maybe that's if you engage the clutch really hard, that motion might push that crankshaft back and cause that little bit of wear on the front thrust bearing. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. I'm just making that up. I would like to know if that is true. Time to put it all together with Graphogen, our assembly lube of choice. Graphogen. Tell them Wonder Woman sent you. I really do wonder if anybody did. So we learned a lot about Graphogen from Wonder Woman in episode 23. One thing she did mention was that it's a colloidal graphite paste. Colloidal graphite. Sounds pretty fancy, doesn't it? Well, as it happens, colloids are pretty common. A colloid is defined as particles dispersed in a medium. In this case, particles of graphite dispersed in oil. Other common colloids are milk, which is particles of fat dispersed in water, or even fog, which is particles of water dispersed in air. Doesn't seem so fancy now, does it? I was also wondering why graphite is used to reduce friction. To answer that, we need to take a look at graphite under a microscope. And the graphite is arranged kind of like loose shale. When something rubs up against the graphite, like the engine parts that we're trying to lubricate, a thin layer of graphite particles easily breaks away from the layer beneath, sacrificing itself in order to save your metal parts from touching each other. You can exploit the lubricating properties of graphite with a simple pencil. While we call them pencil leads, they're actually made of graphite, not lead. Now that everything's lubed up, we can put the bearing carrier halves together. The plastic hammer gets its biannual outing. Now I've been told that if you are torquing something that's important, you want to make sure that the threads and the fasteners are very clean. While these are the new Porsche bolts, I did have them in the bearing carrier when it went through the cryo heat process. And so they have like oil residue and bits and bobs all over them. So I'm just trying to be good and go through and I'm cleaning all the threads with that one bolt by putting it in, cleaning it, putting it in, cleaning it, and then moving on to the next one. So they all are at least pretty clean. It seems really it was just oil in there. So probably this is not necessary, but I'm trying to just make sure I do it right because this is a very important part of the engine. And like I said, these are the Porsche original bolts. It is recommended that you use the ARP bolts in the bearing carrier also. I got that Mimo after I'd already bought the Porsche ones, but they have been through that cryogenic process, which may well make them even stronger than normal. Next then, we need to put some of the ARP lube on the threads and on the heads just to help them get torqued accurately. I'm told that's a good thing to do as well. Then like before, I am strapping the bearing carrier with a tie down to stop it from moving around when I'm trying to torque it. And 
and the new torque wrench there has been working very well, so we're going to continue using that. To begin with, I'm just hand tightening them, no torque at all, just snugging them up to the edge of the metal. I'm getting the ball rolling here with a very low torque setting of 7 newton meters, just to get everything snugged up and to the same starting point. Thank you subscriber Bernard McLake for letting me know that you should tighten these things from the center out. Apparently in the official Porsche workshop manual, which I don't have, the torque setting for the bearing carrier bolts is 25 newton meters. Really a big thank you to the dozen or so people that answered my desperate call online when I was just asking if anybody knew what the torque settings were for this part of the car. And this digital torque wrench that I just got for this job is fantastic. It does like a slow beep that gets faster as you get closer to the reading you want. And then it does a solid beep with a red light once you get there. And then to finish everything up, you have to go around and do 90 degree turns on all of those bolts as well. And once everything was finally torqued down, the crankshaft did spin freely and felt very smooth and awesome. Now that we have a crankshaft to connect them to, our connecting rods or con rods can go in. The connecting rod there, the word Germany is on one side. And I know from the notes I made when I took these off that the Germany word on bank one needs to face towards the pulley side and on the bank two, it needs to face towards the RMS side. The Conrod caps came back with the ARP bolts torqued in place from the machine shop. They were checking them for roundness. And so I just need to take those off and then do the cleaning on these, which same as before, really the scotch right pad with the spray to begin with, and then following up with the uh, Kimtech wipes. And then also the wider big end bearings from Hartech, even though they are new, I'm giving them a bit of a clean up. They seem to have maybe uh, an anti-corrosion covering on them, I'm not sure, but they polished up nicely, just uh, really no abrasion on them, just cleaning them off with the Kimtech wipes. As we spoke about before, these wider big end bearings from Hartech are designed to fix a known problem on these engines, which is uh, excessive wear in those big end bearings. Okay, now that we've got the bearings clean and the conrod and the conrod caps clean, we're going to put our graphogen on there. Going really close to the edge, but not up to the edge. We don't want anything underneath or uh, between the bearings. All right, now we have the actual ARP bolts. These use the ARP lubricant on them. The idea there, I believe, is that you don't have anything hindering their rotation, so you get an accurate torque reading. Then matching the conrod cap to the conrod, these are the scored and cracked rods, so it is pretty easy actually. I quite like that system to be able to know what way the cap should go on to the conrod. And I'm putting the conrod for piston one in position and hand tightening the ARP bolts. As before, I'm starting off with a very low torque of just 10 foot pounds to make sure everything is put together properly before I torque it for real. I'm rolling the bearing carrier over here so you can kind of see what I'm doing. Now is probably a good time to tell you that I'm about to make a mistake here. Thank you Lee Jenkins at Hartech for seeing one of my Instagram posts and messaging me and telling me that I was making this mistake. So right now I'm thinking I put all six con rods on, sort of makes sense, but you don't. At this stage you're only supposed to put on the con rods for pistons four, five and six in bank two. The reasoning for that will hopefully become more apparent as we start putting the bearing carrier back into the engine halves and reattaching the pistons. So I will ask you to humor me for now. I am going to put all six of them on and you can see the process for that. But then at the end of it, I'm going to take off the con rods for cylinders one, two and three. Other than feeling a bit foolish and no harm done, really. I spent a few minutes taking off the bank one uh, con rods there just to fix my mistake. And so this is kind of what it's supposed to look like when it's all done. You've just got the con rods for bank two in position and it's ready for the next stage. Unfortunately though, that is all we have time for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time. <music>